to another episode of the Buffalo Happy Hour. Mike, how are you? I would be better if it wasn't 14 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's cold again today. It's funny. Three weeks ago, it was like 30. And then last week, you and I were on the beach somewhere, basically. It was 75 degrees in here. We were sweating. And now today, it's 30 again. And people wonder why we have sinus issues. Right. But whatever. It's COVID. Uh, but yeah, so we turned the heater on in here at noon. That didn't work. No. Um, a space heater that's been on for four and a half hours should be doing better, but it's fine. Uh, we have winter jackets, so I'm wearing two long sleeves and a coat. And I run hot, so that is saying something. Yeah, it's pretty cold. We did upgrade our heater, though. So we could potentially, I, I don't know what that puts out. I'm not like well-versed in the heater world. I don't know what watts or B- BVU or whatever the hell it's I'm supposed to know. BTUs. All right. Well, what does that stand for, Mr. Smarty Pants? But I don't know. I just know that that's its reference point is how many BTUs. It, I, it's essentially the energy. I don't know. Some friggin' nerd's going to leave a comment and be like, how do you not know what a BTU is? Like, listen. Don't you have to know about this for work or no? No, that's not my department. Okay. I stay in my lane. All right. That's how I survive. <laughs> how many microns world. are in the filter in that one? There, I don't even think there is a filter. I think it's just <laughs> it's a just, coil that just heats up. It's and, just shooting out CO2. We're going to die. <laughs> or carbon monoxide, right? Yeah, carbon yeah. dioxide is the stuff that we emit off. Right? For the trees. Isn't that true? <laughs> okay. So... Here's the thing. We exhale CO2. Plants with it's Absorb. not it's not yeah, but it's not photosynthesis because that's our food source. Right. Right. So the plants take in the CO2 and expel oxygen. Correct. Same with the trees. So that is not doing any of that. The space heater. So if we have too many CO2 in the ozone, isn't that part of the problem right now? Or am I completely wrong? No, I think methane is one of the problems, which is all about the cow farts and oh, yeah. all that other stupidness. Um, but we need more CO2, right? So we need more trees? Is that what the thing is? And we just keep cutting them down? Basically. So the BTU is the British Thermal Unit. That's why oh, I don't know God. anything about it. British. It's an acronym. that It's the measurement... That measures energy. One BTU refers to the amount of energy that's required to increase the temperature of a pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. I did know that now that I read it. It's fine. It's most frequently used when talking about heating and air conditioning units. It's also why I don't know anything about it. Hold on. So it increases it by one degree Fahrenheit? Why didn't they reference Celsius if it's from the Brits? I don't know, man. Figure it out. So what is that? Do you know? It's a, it's a patent. Where'd you get that from? Is that old? Yeah, it's extremely old. There's not even a, a safety on it. Well, actually, there no, is it does. a safety. I did read up on that because I was scared that the garage was going to burn down. We had this thing on for four and a half hours before we came out here, and it's still freezing. So if it tips over, it shuts off because and, it starts on fire. And it regulates temperature. <laughs> See how it's still the unit's on, but it's not producing noise or doing anything? Correct. The fan's off. It's because that is where the room is at now. I don't believe it. And then if you turn the dial and it's not reached that temperature, then it'll kick back on. I don't believe that at all, though. My nose is still frozen, scrunched up. Listen, There's no way that that hit a heat meter. It's like, you know what? It's it's 32 degrees in here. Let's give them a break with this heat stuff. Who knows, man? <laughs> all I know is that it's cold. Yeah, and we got one coming that's Bluetooth now. Yeah, it's going to have an app. It's going to be this craziness. It's going to be sweet. I might honestly buy one for my actual house because upstairs it's freezing. I'm going to buy one for my truck. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding I, right, I don't know so, how this thing works though i guess you mount it on like over the plug so we're gonna have to find well we have a ninety thousand foot extension cord so we can just go to a different one if we want but i'm not sure if it's gonna fit there with the tv and everything not worried i am i'm not well, what happens we'll just move th- we'll move it we put a curtain behind me so uh everybody that's watching doesn't have to look at the door but also now it's kind of a uh it looks like we're in a hospital room or something <laughs> recording yeah a little clean room atmosphere but this is insulated too so obviously you have the two inches below and the four inches above <laughs> where the heat or the coldness can come through but i mean maybe it's doing something i don't know maybe something's better than nothing is my take so that we'll, is very true. We'll crank this thing. We'll see what happens. We'll figure it out. Yeah, but we can't run it while uh, we're recording because one, it's loud and two, the lights start dimming. Right. Because I don't have much power out here. So we're just going to like see how it goes. 
I'm excited. All right. So what's going on, man? How was your week? My nose itches. Uh, Alex is frozen. I know. Didn't we talk about frostbite last week? Do you want to continue the discussion? No. Talk about Mr. Deeds' foot again? (laughs) So (laughs) our week was good. I saw you six out of seven possible days. Uh, We have a lot of recording accomplished. We have a lot coming up. And we golfed. We had brunch. We watched the Bills lose. Watched the Bills lose. Um, and then it was just episodes and interviews yeah. being recorded. So yeah, we, I mean, we're basically roommates. Basically. I probably see you more than I see Gina some weeks. No doubt. But we're going to try to limit it to one, uh, one interview a week. It's getting a lot. I know. There's a lot of editing that goes with this stuff. And there's a lot of people that want to be on the show, which is sweet. But at the same time, like, listen, peeps. All right. We'll slot you. Yeah. We'll get you in. I mean, we still work full time. We still got to take care of our homes. Like, it's got a. This isn't our only gig. Yeah, we just interviewed Serial Spot yesterday, which today is November 17th. So Serial Spot will be coming up shortly for you guys. But when we're recording this, we interviewed them on November 16th. And the episode's not going to air until December 11th. So I feel bad going to these places and being like, yeah, you want to be on the show? All right, next year you'll be on because that's when we can fit you. Right. So eventually we, we've talked about this where we want to do two interviews a week and just not do episodes or have episodes for Patreon members once we get to that point. But right now it's just not feasible, man. So we're just going to keep going with one episode a week, uh, the one interview, and see where it takes us. That's it. We're at almost at 200 subscribers. So also, with uh, since we're still in the beginning of it, hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. We are so close to 200. It's like right there. I can taste it. Yeah, I can also taste the scotch because it literally smells like peat in here. Oh, yeah. So there's well, that. That could also be the fire that started. It's fine. Uh, but yeah, so 81% of people that listen to the stuff the past 28 days have not been subscribed. So that's upsetting because we can have so many more subscribers. We would be at 200 at that point. Right. What does that do? What does it do if we're not subscribed? Nothing. Yeah. But anyway, so we went golfing uh, inside, and it was a good time. How did you feel you played this week? Do you think you played better? I learned a bunch. Uh, Drives were decently consistent. Short game wasn't terrible. Um, I'm focusing in on my irons and making sure that I have set distances for them. Club face stays the same. I'm just working through the kinks, Mm -hmm. you know, just working through the kinks. I still feel like I have to live on a driving range for like three years, but that's fine. You know, I only said that 15 rounds of golf ago, but here we are just still golfing. Yeah, how many driving ranges did you do since then? Listen, (laughs) we don't have time. Yeah, no. We don't have time. And I got the... uh, I got the basement set up finally coming in. Mm-hmm. So the projector and the, the screen are going to get mounted. So that's done. Furniture's on the way. Dude, if you had 12 foot ceilings in your basement, I would live at your house. Because then we can just golf on the simulator at your house. <laughs> I know. You got to have enough room to swing. But uh, yeah, did you flip those rugs back over yet? No. No? No. How long are you li- going to leave them over? Literally the longest time. Probably <laughs> until the furniture comes in. Because then I'll know that they're actually flat. <laughs> when does the furniture come in? Like a week. Are you supposed to like leave them upside down for a while i yeah like it makes sense but i've never heard of it before oh yeah that's the only way to do it because they roll them and then all of a sudden you're gonna have your corners flipped up i don't want that i want a flat rug and someone tripping on it right so i just lay them upside down for like three weeks and then that's it you're getting the sexual sectional coming and left seat why didn't what kind of sectional is it just an l or is it like one of those u kind of like I no it's an l. l just because of the way that yeah. uh once the finished design of the basement's done, then yeah. it'll all fit and make Who's sense. Who's your architect catching up all these designs? Me. <laughs> <laughs> You're a riot. <laughs> so They're necessary. Your basement does. <laughs> I don't know how that episode is doing so well. But anyway, uh, your basement looks great. I was over because we had BHH brunch. Tell them about it, man. You guys are amazing hosts. You and Colleen. We're, we try. Uh, so... Am I telling them about the basement or the food? Both. Okay, so for the basement, I painted the floor, added white trim, did the door casing, um, painted the entire floor throughout the entire basement, resealed the foundation so we won't have any water issues, added the uh, seven cubic foot chest freezer, storage shelves, and then basically outlined everything with the rugs and forming an entertainment space with the wet bar, and it'll be a fully comprehensive entertainment spot for Bill's game, so we're Mm -hmm. stoked for that. That'll be done by about Christmas. Um, and then from there, the brunch was awesome. Uh, we had a massive fruit bowl. We That we didn't eat. <clears throat> right. And then we made 
banana bread that morning, which was good. Uh, we had breakfast pizzas. There were two different kinds of pizzas. There was one with less cheese because Journey uh, wants to limit our cheese intake. Totally get it. Uh, so we made one with not as much cheese as the other. And the one was bacon, sausage, egg, and cheese on a thin crust pizza crust. And then the, which is redundant, but get over it. And then the <clears throat> other one was spinach, goat cheese, and egg. And I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, what else did we eat? We brought there over was, a quiche. Yep. You you brought the quiche. It was a breakfast quiche. Quiche was, was really good. And then leftover sausage and bacon as well. So good. Champagne for mimosas. Uh, you guys made a peach. I don't know that second word. It was just like a peach puree. Word. Yeah. To make with the peaches to make peach bellinis. Yeah. So those were good. Hell yeah. And Hell then, yeah. then we had Devil's River rye whiskey during the game. Uh, and then I switched over to Buffalo Distillings as well. Uh, had to crush the rest of their bottle. And so yeah. we ended up losing the game for anybody that followed along. Yeah, we did. But like, you can't be mad, right? I was mad. <laughs> so I saw a stat today, and I know I told you about this. The three defenders that were guarding uh, Hopkins for that end zone catch, which was remarkable. Being such a high caliber player that he is, if you high point the ball, there's no way anyone else can take it from you. Like he just executed that jump perfectly and Kyler put it to where only he can get it. And there's no way that a defender can. Uh, I mean, maybe I don't know if he perfectly placed the ball. It was just, it was in the middle of four people. Yeah. It wasn't perfectly placed. Hopkins perfectly placed himself to catch it in that situation Yeah, because he high pointed the ball. He's taller than all of them and he has bigger hands than all of them, which led me to measure my hand. Have you ever measured your hand? When yeah, re- nine and a half inches because of you. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I'm nine uh, and three quarters. Put me in there, coach. I got it. See, but weren't you intrigued to know? And D Hop has a ten inch hand span. Hell yeah! So I could take him. No. <laughs> I don't know if you read my post, but I said I can jump thirty five point five inches lower <laughs> than he can because yeah, he has a thirty six um, inch vertical. In vertical leap, which. I've never even measured mine. Back in my prime, I probably could have gotten like, I don't know, a f- I don't even know what's big, like 14 inches, 16 inches. Is that like a good jump? I don't know. Probably not. We're white. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, I think my vertical is like four inches. No, we can get higher than that. They only measure the ground to your, the bottom of your foot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, n- technically, yes, but you do it by yeah. that. So, yeah. But I, I think you could probably... In your prime, dude, you could probably get up to a foot, which is still 24 inches shorter than what DeAndre Hopkins could do. They're freaks of nature. I don't understand. Their broad jump is like 12 feet. If you see uh, DK Metcalf, he has like a 46-inch vertical leap. Yeah. It's just gross. They got bunnies, bro. They just <laughs> levitate. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we ended up losing the game, unfortunately. But uh, now at least I know that I could take on D-Hop if I wanted to. Sure. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> Goodness. Beep. Oh, God, Mike. Oh, God, I love scotch so much. It's I, chilled, too, just because it's 14 degrees in here. <laughs> <laughs> Golly. I love it, man. I All right, so scotch. let's let's talk about it. All right, let's dive into the whiskey section. Nailed it. <laughs> the garage is going to blow over. It's fine. So McKellen 12-year double cask, 86 proof, 43% ABV. For awards, it's McKellen. They place in every event and competition, so it doesn't matter. They win. Um, they have too many awards for me to list and type out. It's just there's no sense. It's McKellen. Okay. For the company background, it's pretty interesting. Uh, the distillery is built on six pillars. So... The pillars are spir- spiritual home. Oh, so it's a figuratively pillars, yeah, figurative it's, pillars, yes. not six not literal things in the ground. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Uh, so, uh, spiritual home, curiously small stills, a finest cut, exceptional oak casks, natural color, and peerless spirit. 
So kind of touching on all of that, the best part is in 1824, Alexander Reed was a school teacher and a barley farmer. He founded the McAllen Distillery after the Scottish excess tax. Uh, yeah. The So, wow. The Scottish excess ace legalized distilling. So Scotland legalized distilling. He was a teacher, and he's like, I want to get everybody drunk. So Perfect. Because he was a barley farmer, he's like, let's open up a distillery, and let's go to town. In 1824. So he founded the distillery, um, and then he made the first whiskey McKellen ever produced in a woodshed with just two pot stills. By 2013, the company announced plans to build a 100 million pound production facility. A little bit of growth. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. So McKellen makes up one third of the entire world's single malt whiskey market. They are also the only distillery in Scotland that has its own master of wood, which goes back to exceptional oak casks. Mm -hmm. So they have a person, in this case, Stuart uh, McPherson, who sources 200,000 oak barrels from oak trees in the U.S., but primarily in Spain, has them dried and shaped in a cooperage in Spain, and then seasoned with Oloroso sherry, which makes this process about 10 times more expensive than most oak barrel production, but it's McAllen, so what else would you expect? Right. The fun facts is this scotch is all natural and not dyed at all to change its color. The estate is rumored to be haunted, which goes back to a spiritual home, uh, and a bottle of McAllen once, co- once sold more than what it cost to go to college. Really? So a bottle of 1946 McAllen in a crafted crystal bottle sold at auction for $460,000 in 2017. The coolest thing about this is that the money went to a charity dedicated to providing safe drinking water for about 30,000 people. Where at? Do you know? <laughs> That's I, sweet, though. I, no, I'm sure it was in there, but yeah. I was just picking up the fun stuff. That's no really one gives sweet. a shit where it was. It was well, just, you know, $460,000 in 2017 right. for a bottle of scotch. Goodness. <laughs> In a handcrafted diamond bottle or crystal bottle, sounds like something out of Superman. Right. So for their products, uh, they have a they have a lot, but just to name a few, they have a classic cut 2020 edition. They also have different years editions for the classic cut. They have a double cask 12 year, 15 year, and 18 year. They have double cask gold edition four, five, and six. Then they have a sherry oak, which we've also tried, uh, not on this podcast, but you and I have mm-hmm. uh, aged. 12, 18, 25, and 30 years. And then they have a fine oak, uh, 10, 12, and 18 year, plus a bunch more. So there's a lot more stuff that we could dive into, but it's, I mean, it's McAllen. Yeah. Everybody understands the prestige of McAllen. They, yeah. like, for example, guys, they have a distillery tour that's 250 pounds per person for four hours. And then you, you basically get like an engraved glass to go with your experience. Um, You can shop at their gift shop. You do a full tour, and then it comes with a uh, flight at the end at the new bar. flight home? No, no. (laughs) Right. (laughs) At their new bar, and then you basically get to get the full experience at the McAllen Distillery. So check out that video that released this. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Because we're just like there. We just posted up a video. We're like, yeah, we're in Scotland, whatever. Could you imagine? So McAllen is in that area of Scotland that is... Highland slash Speyside. Um, some other notable ones in that area, if you know, are Glen Levitt, Glen uh, Morangi, like those type of island or Speyside whis- or scotches. What's interesting about this one is, like like you kind of touched on, since this is a double cask, that obviously means that there's two barrels to it. There is one barrel that they have in Scotland that they have all of their normal products in. But that second barrel, like you were saying, which is very interesting for a Scotland distillery to do, is take a oak barrel from the United States, put sherry in it, and then empty the sherry out and then put this whiskey in that barrel for that second barrel um, kind of maturation process where it extracts all that flavors. So this is a very intricate process that McAllen has done for this, I guess, collection of whiskeys that are the the double cask so that's why you're getting some of those like fruity fruity notes Mm -hmm. to it which we'll talk about a little bit later but this is very very good and if you if you know scotch you know what mccallan is it's kind of like the like the pinnacle of what space side whiskey is it's super good and i'm not a massive scotch guy but because it's it's not very peaty i mean you right you can smell it Mm -hmm. but the 
it doesn't travel with it when you taste it, which is good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I just love McAllen. I love scotch. Um, and this is just a great product. And it's like, you look at it and you're like, wow, that's, that looks like a good bottle of scotch. Yeah. Yeah. It's got the, the prestige to it. How much are they? Uh, this bottle is, I believe, about anywhere from, depending on the store, anywhere from 66 to 80 bucks. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So. Yeah, man, it, it's very good. Mm-hmm. So we'll we'll continue drinking it and uh, get into the cocktail section, and then rate it in a little bit, huh? That's it. All right. <laughs> all right, all right. Goodness, for some reason my ears are ringing, and it makes absolutely no sense. Like it's like tinnitus is just coming oh, into my life. Yeah, I was, I was hoping you develop some time. sort of disease right now. I know. Uh, maybe I have it. Describe it to me. I probably have it too. Tinnitus. <laughs> No. Have Just you heard kidding. the Because I'm a heavy contract. I know, that was I, a know joke, I know. I I picked Jesus. it up. I picked up what you were putting down. Alright, <laughs> <laughs> you want to jump into the cocktail section? Yeah, drop the beef in the cocktail section. Cocktails. Wow. So mine's the honey pot. Ooh. It's two ounces of McKellen double cask twelve year, half an ounce of Mitica Oak honey. Three quarter ounce fresh lemon juice and a dash of Angostria bitters. Nice. Yeah. Have you had? Have you ever had a cocktail with? Hold no. On a second. Hold hold that thought. No, I haven't. So my cocktail. I said hold the thought. <laughs> Discussion after. <laughs> uh, my cocktail is called the penicillin. So story around that. I'll tell you after I read the ingredients. See that, Michael? Leave them hanging. All right, so two ounces of blended scotch, three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice, freshly squeezed, three quarters of an ounce of honey ginger syrup, one quarter ounce of Isla single malt scotch, uh, and garnish with a candy ginger. So you're putting two different types of scotch in there. The blended single malt could, or the blended single malt would be one, and then you could put this uh, single malt scotch of McAllen in there as well if you want. Uh, but yeah, you ended. You add the blended scotch, lemon juice, and syrup into a shaker with ice and shake until well chilled, like this is right now because it's negative four degrees in here. Strain into a rocks glass over fresh ice, top with a smoky single malt scotch, and then garnish with a piece of candy ginger. And that's how you have that. Now I want candy. Yeah, so how to make a honey ginger syrup, which would be very interesting. And I should actually do this because I do love this cocktail. Honey ginger syrup. You combine one cup of honey, one six-inch piece of peeled and thinly sliced ginger, and one cup of water in a saucepan over high heat and bring to a boil. Reduce heat to a minimum or a medium, my bad, and simmer for five minutes. Place in the refrigerator to steep overnight and strain with a cheesecloth. I don't even know what a cheesecloth is. Really? Do you know what a cheesecloth is? Yeah, hell yeah. We use it during air, urban ops for area reconnaissance. Or I'm sorry. No, I was right. For area reconnaissance missions. What is it? So a cheesecloth can be used to break up silhouettes. Um, but it's it's basically just a finely meshed screen, essentially. Mm. It's really thin. But you would angle it. This is going to get pretty technical, but you would use cheesecloth to angle, uh, say you're in front of a window and then you're conducting surveillance outside of the window. Sorry, NSA and CIA don't flip out. You take cheesecloth and then you put it on an angle um, in front of you and then you're behind it. And then what that happens is the light reflects uh, oh, due okay. to retra- uh, ref- refraction. Yeah. It bounces out and then it breaks up the silhouette. So somebody just sees a blank window when really there's somebody behind that. And then you would just camouflage what's behind you, um, dim the lights and all that other craziness, and then you have a fully operational AO inside of a room. So, yeah, that's all part of... That's pretty sweet. Reconnaissance for urban ops. Well, have you ever seen that thing that like women post about, like, oh, be wary of this, where there's a two-way mirror, and then they put their finger against the mirror, and if there's a gap there, that means that someone's watching you pee on the other side of the w- mirror? Have you seen that circulate? Uh, no, I've. Uh, first of all, I'm not a pervert, and then second of all, the life that <laughs> I'm not women. Saying I did it. No, I know, but <laughs> the life that women have to live. Yeah. Are you kidding? The, how is it? Why is that a thing? Right. Because peeping Tom is obviously not our Tom, but a Tom <laughs> is peeping Tom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's disgusting. I don't understand. There she's going. Because it's 14 degrees. Yeah, it reached negative four in here, so the heater's like, all right, I'll cut them some slack. I don't even think the mics are going to pick that up. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. If it's annoying, just... Oh, it it only works for three seconds. It was like, all right, it got up to (laughs) 40.5 degrees. It's fine. As long as they don't get frostbite, I'm not held uh, responsible for this. But uh, so I went to Hydraulic Hearth, which 
subscribe because they're going to be on an episode in the future. A little teaser for that. I uh, went to Hydraulic Hearth and the dude behind the bar, when I go to a bar, and we probably talked about this already, but when I go to a bar, I want to sit at the bar to talk with the bartender. With current times, it's kind of difficult to do that now, but sitting at the bar and talking with them and be like, dude, this is what I like. Just make me something that you like. I told him that the guy's been there for five years. If you've been to Hydraulic Hearth and you've been going there for a while, you know exactly who I'm talking about already. The dude got like his face lit up. He's like, oh, yeah, absolutely. Let's do this. So he gave me a uh, pretty sweet and like tarty drink first. And then I went back up to him and I'm like, hey, I'll take another one. This time, can I make it a little bit more smoky and like manly, you know? And he was like, ah, absolutely. So he made me this penicillin drink which is why I got that or I suggested that today. It is such a good cocktail. I have been thinking about that ever since because I love scotch and it doesn't dilute the peatiness of the scotch. And normally I'm not a huge cocktail person when it comes to scotch because normally they're pretty expensive, but this cocktail is fantastic. So if any of you want to try that cocktail, definitely try it out. And if you're from the Buffalo area, go to hydraulic and have the man behind the bar make a penicillin cocktail because he's fantastic at it. So what are you doing after this? Going to Hartman's to get some penicillin. Hartman's? Or uh, Hydraulic Hearth, sorry. Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> I, I had to give a little shout out to my boys over at Hartman's. Too. <laughs> you know, that was, a, that was a conscious mistake. Love it. So what do you think? You want to rate this thing? Hell yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I hate you. All right. Uh, label branding. I got to update this board. I don't even remember. <laughs> what do we do here anymore? This thing is not <laughs> It has been crazy over here, guys. All right. So label branding. What are you giving it? A3 pluses. I agree. I agree. I agree. Here's why. It's very prestigious, of course, right? It's a nice scotch. Um, this is something that you drink when you're celebrating something. You don't just have this because it's a Tuesday, unless you're uh, the Buffalo Happy Hour. Yeah. But I like I like this box, of course. I love most marketing material. Makes me super happy inside. But the bottle itself, what I do like is the age. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to point with my... Point I, with your finger. No, I, I almost said something that would have got us like in trouble by, I don't know, somebody that censors things because the army almost came out of my, my word hole. But oh. anyways, I like the fact that this is here and it's kind of embedded into the bottle. It's not mm. just kind of like a piece of, like that's the actual, the glass is shaped to that. Gotcha, okay. Yeah, so I, I, I like that a lot. I can't see that from here. That's sweet. Yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, the label is very, it's very professional mm-hmm. and elegant. So I do like that a lot. And I love the color of the scotch which I think actually enhances the label and branding Absolutely. because when you look at it, you're like, oh, damn. So this is this is something a little more unique because most distilleries around the world dye their whiskey, yeah. and most people don't know that. So to have something this raw, again, uh, natural color is one of their six pillars, I think it needs to be discussed and given credit to. Yeah. It's a nice – so with that um, label at the top – it is a different color gold than what you would expect. Yeah. It's not this blasting gold that you would associate it with. It's kind of more of like a copper gold, which mirrors the color of the whiskey. So it mm-hmm. kind of all blends in, which is nice. McCallum's marketing department is fantastic because they are a budget, not a budget. I shouldn't say that, but they are a less expensive scotch. This is only 60 bucks. I mean, you can get some crazy scotches for like $200. Mm-hmm. They are a budget type of scotch with an elite name t- tied to it their their marketing department has killed it for a very long time they're at every single convention they just do everything that they can to get their name out there and their product speaks for itself yeah a3 pluses i like it nose i'm getting a lot of oak a lot of butterscotch and caramel yeah which is typical of your space side highland whiskey I have literature for you to read. <laughs> and then you're kind of getting like a little bit of a moss, but not really. Yeah, not really. The The nose is where you pick up, like you were saying, the sweet and then a little bit of the fruit and the oak mm-hmm. is in your face. But it's actually a, it's a pretty enjoyable experience. It's very friendly. For me. Right. Yeah, yeah that's 
I like that. It is friendly. I'm going to go A3 pluses. Mm-hmm. I, agree, I, agree, I, agree. I agree. I agree. Initial taste. Yeah, caramel and butterscotch transitions into the taste. The oak is gone in the initial taste. But what you're kind of picking up is this. Maybe this is more towards the ending. No, it's definitely towards the ending. No, I'll hold my thought till that. Because I just got all of that flavor at the end. You say honey? Uh, I could. Honey. It's also, this is like legitimately chilled. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Because most people have scotch on the rocks. Mm-hmm. But we're having it chilled neat. Right. Which is a pretty unique experience, but cheers to Buffalo. And oh, yeah. Scotland, they probably do the same thing. Cause I don't it's, know. If that uh, heater turns on again, we might have it slightly less chilled by 0.5 degrees. If that. UBT or whatever, BTU, B- BVU. B- BTU. <laughs> Bravo Tango uniform. <laughs> uh, initial taste, I'm going to go A++. Okay. I'll take it. I agree, I agree, I agree. I agree, I agree, I agree. Ending note. Fig. I'm getting raisins. Yeah. Relatively similar. It's like a, a dark fruit. No, yes. you can kind of go like a dark cherry too, maybe. Right. But it's that type of family that you're getting. And it hits you a little bit in the beginning of the like or at the ending of the initial taste. Yes. But as soon as it leaves your tongue, it stays there. Yes. And it's a very prominent fig, raisin, dark cherry, dried dried dark fruit at the end of it maybe a cranberry too i'm with you that just oh it's so good Mm. and that could be because of the sherry cask the double casking process i haven't had one of their regular products in a while so i don't know if that characteristic is similar to the single cask but my thought process initially is because of the sherry double cask yeah the the sherry cask is so much sweeter than this double cask Oh yeah, so much sweeter. We'll probably do it next week, but yeah, it's fine. I mean, we haven't bought any products in so long. No, I love it. All right, so ending note: a four pluses. No, plus 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 plus. Uh, final it. rating. Give me that countdown. Three, two, one. Ninety four. Ninety four point five. Nope. Ninety five. There you go. Nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as it left my mouth, I'm like, "That's wrong. That's wrong. That's definitely wrong, Mike." fine uh, you are a riot I use a calculator all the time now yeah so that is our whiskey review for mccallan double cask this is a great product it is a very friendly product it makes you feel very warm inside and not because it's alcohol but because it's very friendly and easy to drink which it's in not, 2020 we need to feel warm inside right it's not a typical scotch it is a product that you can drink whenever you want even if it is a tuesday night like we're doing right now but if you're into bourbon, if you're into different types of whiskey and you want to try scotch, this, again, is a very good transition whiskey that will get you into that market because it's a space side, because it's very friendly, because it has notes of that butterscotch caramel up front that ease into a fig at the end. You're not getting a ton of peat. So definitely go check uh, what liquor stores around you have it and pick up a bottle if you can. No doubt. All right. Let's get into the new mi- uh, segment miniseries section. We have a lot to talk about, so we'll uh, we'll dive in. You start, and then uh, I'll wrap up. Yeah. So anybody that's new here right now, uh, we'll try to yeah, blow through this here? right now. Yeah. So anybody that's new here right now, we have this new segment in our show where we call it a segment mini series. In this segment mini series, we're focusing on the history of Buffalo. We've been on four episodes so far. This is going to be our fifth in this series. Started off at pre-colonization, and right now we're going to talk about the railroads and the industry from 1850 to 1900. So if you're interested in anything that happened before 1850, check out our playlist that goes through all those episodes in order and go check them out. Leave a comment or a like or something. Uh, but right now we're going to talk about railroads and industry. So by 1850, the city's population was about 81,000. And by 1853, Buffalo annexed Black Rock, which had been Buffalo's fierce rival for the canal terminus. 
During the 19th century, thousands of pioneers going to the western United States debarked from canal boats to continue their journey out of Buffalo by late or by lake or rail transport. During their stopover, many experienced the pleasures of danger and dangers of Buffalo's notorious canal district. The Erie Canal's peak year was 1855 when 33,000 commercial shipments took place. That's a ton of shipments. It's insane. And a lot changes because of that time frame of 50 years. Yeah. So Buffalo was part, uh, and this is more just keynotes, and we'll dive into the specifics later on. But Buffalo was a part of. Uh, was part of and the seat of Niagara County until the legislature passed an act separating the two on April 2nd, 1861. In 1852, randomly, a man was publicly hung or hanged, I'm pretty sure, for murdering his wife of three months. What's the story behind that? Was that just like the first Buffalo hanging? No. Oh, uh, nailed it. But there was, it was just a keynote because you can go back in public records and see what happened by year in the city of Buffalo. And that was one of the keynotes that happened that year in the city of Buffalo. The guy was married for three months, killed his wife after uh, getting not like because courts weren't necessarily set up right. like a municipal court like today. That's later in this 50 year time frame. But how long do you think that they were together before he they ultimately got married? And then he's like, you know what? I, I got to kill you. Well, I don't know, because he hit her with the end of an axe, um, like the shaft end of the axe, and then got in trouble for that. And then like a couple weeks later, he flipped the axe her. around and he's like, let me try this again. But I couldn't find how he killed her. But his last words were, uh, he was screaming like, I didn't murder my wife. And then they just pulled the lever and he was hanged publicly in like Niagara Square. So he gone. Jesus. Well, you know, that's don't kill your wife. Do you think they lived together before? And he's just like, you know what? We're starting to live together now. You don't <laughs> clean the dishes very quickly. So, you know what? I'm just going to try the end of this act and then we'll see how it goes from there. It's pretty wild. Maybe. What a riot. I know. Uh, I mean, 1852 must have been a really dull year if that was the <laughs> the um, like the thing of record for that year. But anyway, right. so William Fargo, Buffalo native, he partnered with Henry Wells and formed Wells Fargo and Company, which is one of the bigger banks in the entire area. Grover Cleveland lived in Buffalo from 1854 until 1882, and he has a great golf course if anybody wanted to check that out, and served as Buffalo's mayor from 1882 until 1883 before eventually becoming the 22nd and the 24th president of the United States. Who is the 23rd? Who's in between? I can't remember. Me either. Go ahead. We're really good at this. Yeah. All right. President-elect Abraham Lincoln uh, was the 20th. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Visit Buffalo on February 16th as a part of his trip to Washington, D.C. To accept the presidency of the United States, Lincoln stayed at the American Hotel on Main Street between Eagle and Court. Reading through some of this, it's really cool Like how many presidents are like, you know what? I'm going to stop in Buffalo. Grover Cleveland was paramount in most things Buffalo. Yeah. And he's done way more than just be a president and a mayor so and live here. Yeah, he has and, a good golf course. I told you that. And we'll talk about what else he's done, but his house was commonplace for John Quincy. I think it was John Quincy Adams was the president between him, um, which is Sam uh, yeah. Sam Adams' son. Yep. So he uh, – I'll, I'll fact check myself on that, but because we don't have Joe Rogan's Jamie here helping us out. But uh, we got James there. He's a little bit slower, so I'll give him a second. Yeah. Um, so in 1867, the Buffalo Club was formed. Is that the Buffalo Tournament Club? Another golf course? Nailed it. No. <laughs> so for those that don't know, the Buffalo Club is an actual. Uh, it's it's a very prestigious uh, networking, shoulder rubbing. The the people that are Buffalo. Uh, our members there. It's an insane monthly due that you have to pay, and then it's mainly used for like businesses and networking and a lot politics, of politics, f- probably politics, financial planners, and that. Yeah, it's it's a networking club. It's it's all about status. In 1870, a group of Jesuits left Europe in response to Bishop John Timon's call for Catholic institution to serve European immigrants settling in Western New York. The Jesuits founded Buffalo's first Catholic college and named it Saint Peter Canisius a distinguished Jesuit theologian, scholar, and educator of the 16th century. By 1872, the college will have moved to a more spacious quarters at Washington and Tupper Street. They shared that location with Canisius High School for 40 years. It's pretty insane that Canisius College was originated in 1870, yeah. when you think about it. Also, the 23rd president was Benjamin Harrison. Yeah. So, so Okay, so you are more at, like around the Buffalo culture, obviously, than I am. Is Timon tied to Saint or to Canisius at all? No. 
So this dude came over, John Timon, and he's like, you know what? We're not going to call this Timon. We're going to call this T- Canisius. What started Timon? Another dude come over, and he's I like, my name there. is Timon. I didn't go there, so I didn't get beat with their, their history or by nuns. So Good, good point. Nailed it. All right. Grover Cleveland was then elected sheriff of Erie County, the best paying and most difficult job in local government from 1870 to 1873. Yeah. That sounds about right. And then Buffalo hires a regular police force. Before that, deputies and regional police kept the peace within the area. Mm-hmm. So then in 1879, Delaware Street became Delaware Avenue. In 1880, the municipal court system f- is finally established, so people aren't being hung in the streets anymore, <laughs> and the Buffalo Police Department is officially organized. Also, a full-time prof- professional fire department is organized. A lot happened in these 50, in these 50 years, so everybody kind of bear with us. All right, so in 1880, the Buffalo Bisons played 82 games during the 1880 season and won 24 of them and lost 58. Sounds about right. <laughs> and finished in seventh position. What? <laughs> what were the other teams like? <laughs> Jesus, this isn't Bills. The Buffalo Bisons played their home games at Riverside Grounds, where 20,000 fans witnessed more than now their club finishing the season with a .293 win percentage. And toilet paper is officially formed by a British company. What? Yep. All right. So there's a British company. Why is that tied to the Bisons? <laughs> is it because they're shit? It's, no, it's in the oh, same year. Nailed it. All right. So in 1880, toilet paper showed up. Just to put things in perspective. Yeah. And now you can't find it on the shelves anywhere. In 1882, horse-drawn cars are being replaced by cars powered with storage batteries. And later, Elon Musk was born. No. <laughs> by using overhead trolley wires. Yep. Grover Cleveland is then elected mayor of Buffalo for one term, one year term. He will resign to become New York State governor. Which, again, just speaks to his involvement in Buffalo and New York prior to becoming president. Which, which he is also why. he also signed the bill that protected Niagara Falls. Oh, okay. Yep. Which is why everything in Buffalo is like named after him. Yeah. He's obviously very prominent. So in 1889, for anybody that didn't know he was prominent, he's very prominent, let me tell you. In 1889, plans formed for Lackawanna Steel Company. In 1890, Buffalo's population is now 255,000. In Erie County, is 322,981. So Buffalo is basically all of Erie County. Yeah. 1990, Buffalo is the second largest railroad terminus in the U.S. Chicago is obviously the first. There are seven district lines connecting Buffalo with six different East Coast cities. New York Central is so big that it has its own police force. Railroad companies created a new industry in the city. They own 3,600 acres of city land and lay 660 miles of track within the city limits. They directly employ 20,000 men and indirectly give work to thousands more in the car wheel shops, palace car shops, locomotives and freight car sh- shops, and is in the largest bridge community in the world. Company. Uh, company, nailed it. Uh, all of which are located in the city. As a result of railroads, Erie Canal is basically obsolete at this point. Uh, by the turn of the century, almost every lake steamship company uh, had been bought out by the railroads, thus by either controlling the freight rail, the freight rates or their railroads, or by dictating lake freight policy, the railroads exert a controlling influence over the city's commercial economy. Crazy stuff. Yeah. A lot happened in those 50 years. And we'll get into a little more details uh, a brief, like not every single thing, all those bullet points we're not going to dive into because this podcast would be 14 hours long, but we are going to dive into the railroad industry in Buffalo. Yeah. So in 1816, I'm sorry, 1860, many railway companies and lines crossed through and terminated in Buffalo. Major ones were the Buffalo, Bradford and Pittsburgh railroad in 1859, Buffalo and the Erie railroad and the New York central railroad in 1853. But during this time, Buffalonians controlled a quarter of all shipping traffic on Lake Erie, and shipbuilding was a thriving industry for the city. Later, the Lee Valley Railroad would have its line terminate at Buffalo in 1867. So now in 1860, less than 5% of the workforce works in manufacturing as compared to 10% in Rochester and Syracuse. Industries that do exist produce strictly for the local market. The Erie Canal is becoming obsolete once again because of railroad competition. It's just too slow, too expensive, and you can't use it most times because it's frozen during the winter months. Like we are right now. So, correct. So this led to the strike of 1877, which actually had a lot of implications moving forward um, and an interesting use of personnel. But essentially what happened was 
every city and small town in the industrial Northeast is affected by the uprisings of 1877, when thousands of railroad workers striked uh, because they were protesting a 10% wage reduction on all the railroads throughout the region. Violence basically broke out everywhere. So small towns, including West Virginia, New York, PA, uh, or I'm sorry, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Chicago, and Buffalo. Everybody went up in arms. So in Buffalo specifically, disputes between capital and labor had traditionally been limited to small, isolated confrontations between skilled workers and small-scale businessmen. Yeah, because they'd be hung if they did anything crazy. Yeah. But the railroad strike of 1877 comes as an incredible shock because it was so widespread across the country. Um, It created panic and uncertainty and terror in the city. So in early July of 1877, on the east side and in South Buffalo, where railroad lines and yards are so prevalent, strikers concentrated on disrupting the movement of passengers and freight cars. Listen to this. So they pull out switch lights, they grease the tracks, they take possession of the locomotives, they uncouple trains, which means they break them apart car by car, and then they successfully threaten strike breakers. So... 300 volunteers, 1,600 state militiamen, 1,800 Civil War veterans, plus the cops, are marshaled to deal with the emergency. Yeah, so if anybody was wondering, this is what Red Dead Redemption was based off of. Continue, Mike. (laughs) So in street clashes... Eight soldiers were wounded and eight strikers were killed. The strikers got little local support and were quick, uh, quickly demoralized. No other group of workers joined them. No newspaper endorsed their efforts, which obviously shows you the power of media. And within a week, the resistance was broken. Fake news. Fake news. So the Buffalo Central Terminal wasn't constructed until 1929. Yeah, I thought that that was super interesting because yeah. I thought Buffalo Central Terminal is a historic monument. Like, it's... It has historic rights. It's it can't be touched, basically. And I thought that that would have dated back to the start of the railroad back in what eighteen sixty or whatever seventies. Yeah, and it didn't start until fifty years later, six years later, which is pretty crazy. So yeah. I, I just I looked that up because I was going to do a ton of research on it. But we'll get to that next episode. Stay tuned. <laughs> so <clears throat> there was obviously something that happened in the country between 1850 and 1900. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, maybe not. So the Civil War and the draft and the importance of it for Buffalo, the WASP elite, which is the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, benefited from the Civil War. Of course, the rich get richer. Yeah, bad So, <laughs> So not only were they able to avoid service in the military, because some of the WASP elites, however, chose to serve as officers in local militia companies, but... They profited enormously as a result. Buffalo grew and prospered greatly during the war. The population continued its rapid increase from 81,029 in 1860 to 94,210 five years later. That's crazy. And its lake-oriented economy boomed as other commercial arteries and outlets like the Mississippi River and New Orleans were closed to raw materials from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the war, Buffalo's position as a leading inland port in the U.S. was more firmly fixed than ever before. That's crazy. And it's essentially because the North was starving the South of resources. So we we shut the Mississippi River out. And then we starved New Orleans and their ports. And then that's how the North won. For everybody in the South listening, hate to break it to you. Oh, on the North won. So the draft was imposed on a community only in the event that a predetermined quota was not filled by area volunteers. The county's annual quota was 3,808. So 3,808 people were all that was needed to volunteer to fill the quota. Out of 92,000 at the point. Yeah. In a frenzied and last-ditch effort to hire the needy to volunteer, bounty funds were created by the Common Council at the intense urging of Mayor Fargo. The Erie County Board of Supervisors, the Board of Trade and Private Funds, and the average bounty increases from 150 bucks to 500 bucks a head. This is totally Red Dead Redemption, just saying. I had a lot of bounties in Red Dead. So while even this generous bounty fund does not prevent the imposition of a draft in Erie County, it does enable most of the wealthier and more influential citizens to escape it because they could just pay it. Mm -hmm. Among them is Grover Cleveland, who's a young and politically ambitious lawyer. Who he was by politically paying, ambitious? No. Never would have thought. Yeah, really. <laughs> by paying $500 to a recently arrived Polish immigrant, is able to pass the war in the comfort and prosperity of his blossoming legal practice. 
So because of that, the 155th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment was formed in October 1862, which included more than 400 Buffalo men, most of which were Irish, keynote, heed President Abraham Lincoln's call for additional volunteers during the Civil War and crowded into Fort Porter near present-day Peace Bridge to become the basis of the 155th New York Volunteer Infantry Regiment. So the draft had a huge effect on race relations. Uh, race relations within Buffalo. So this is pretty hairy. The draft and the bounty system provoked intense reactions among the city immigrants, particularly be among the unskilled laborers who were most valuable, uh, vulnerable to the system because they couldn't pay it. Right. So in late July and early August, 1863 in protest against low wages, almost a hundred dock workers and Steve door, Steve doers, primarily Irish go out, go out on a strike and their employers respond by hiring black people as strike breakers. So they basically just caused a huge intake in uh, or uptick in, in violence mm-hmm. because the Irish were like, fine, then we'll just fight you. I Sure. Right. So coming within months of the Emanci- Emancipation Proclamation, the strike breaking by blacks uh, take on a... Om- Ominous. Ominous. Thank you. My yep. mouth was like not doing that. Unique and, New York. <laughs> unique New York. <laughs> and complex meaning for the Irish waterfront workers. Um, so the Irish were asking, <clears throat> are you expecting me to offer my life to free people who offer thanks by breaking the strike? That was the point the Irish made. Yep. The angry dock workers stampede away from the waterfront across Main Street business sections and into the small black residential section in the eastern part of the city. After hours of uncertainty, the rioters are dispersed by the 65th and 74th militia regiments who just returned from riot duty in New York, with, uh, and they were working in partnership with local PD and citizens posing of about 7,000 people. It's crazy that they were rioting back then when they didn't even have TVs to steal from Walmart. It's right. crazy. right. I mean, what were they even rioting for at that we're, point? We're going to get shut down. <laughs> <laughs> so this brings us right into a uh, more cheerier subject, the history of the Buffalo Zoo. So Jacob E. Berg told a Buffalo furrier, uh, that sounds weird, presented a pair of deer to the city of Buffalo to provide the deer with room to graze. Elam R. Jewett, the publisher of the Buffalo Daily Journal, offered to house the deer on his estate. Simultaneously, plans were being made for the municipal North Park, today Delaware Park, and Mayor William F. Rogers hired landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted to include a zoo as part of the park's design. Five years after the deer were donated, more animals were added to the collection, and the first permanent building was erected, signifying the establishment of the Buffalo Zoological Wow, Zoological Garden in 1875. So that's the start of the zoo. Yeah, and in 1875, the zoo was officially founded, which makes it the seventh oldest zoo in the country. And in regards to tourism, it's the second largest attraction, second to Niagara Falls. They bring in about 400,000 people annually. Um, The zoo's located on 23 and a half acres. It's open year round. It features 1,200 wild and exotic animals, as well as 320 different species of plants. So that's pretty interesting. The accreditation process is a bear and the Buffalo Zoo is accredited, no pun intended. Um, but the the Buffalo Zoo is accredited, so I wanted to throw this fact in because that changes the entire game of the Buffalo Zoo because most zoos are not accredited. Yeah. So the accreditation is a process by which a program, organization, or inst- institution is evaluated by recognized experts in the profession and is measured against the established standards and best practices of that profession. Only those zoos and aquariums that earn AZA accreditation can become members of the AZA, which accreditation means the official recognition and approval of a zoo, aquarium, wildlife, wildlife park, or sanctuary by a group of experts. In December 2018, the Buffalo Zoo's president was named to the AZA uh, commission, which is a big deal. So Nora Fletchall, who was the Buffalo Zoo president and CEO, has been appointed to serve on the AZA commission. So kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal, yeah. And the most important part about the Buffalo Zoo, they didn't gun down my boy Harambe. Correct. So we're automatically better. Beep. Cheers to Harambe. Yeah, cheers to Harambe. Pour a little out for him, but not of the scotch. The scotch is too good. Pour some off for the boy. Yeah. So 
That was a lot of information. Yeah, so basically people went on strike. The Civil War happened. Grover Cleveland just decided what job he wanted at what level of politics before he became president. And uh, the Erie Canal was deemed obsolete and unnecessary. So they switched to railroads, and that changed everything. Yeah. If you take one thing away from this, I want you to take away that in 1852, some dude was just randomly hung because he murdered his wife. Listen, we should bring it back. Yeah, we should. We That's really where I stand. Yeah. If you, Especially for pedophiles and like sexual assaulters, that, just hang them. That and if if you like if you're convicted of dog cruelty, true, you should be publicly hanged. And I would I would watch. Would you think that if they did do that, they would have a mass gathering like they do like they did in the olden times? No question. <laughs> No. Oh, it reached 14 degrees again. See? We got to go to 14.5. Right, it'll turn off in three, two. No. <laughs> so that was the railroad and industry section of the history of Buffalo segment miniseries that we're doing. Next week, we are going to talk about the City of Light, which, again, is another 57-year. Yep, turned off. 57-year yeah. segment of history. We can't We can't do these 50-year segments anymore. All right, don't worry about it, because in uh, <laughs> suburbanization and decline, the next one is 1957 to 2010. So we're really pushing that limit. Uh, but yeah, so we're going to continue doing these. We're reaching the end. Obviously, if you know anything about timelines, is that as we get closer to the present day, this segment is going to end. So, and it's going to end with COVID. No. So, <laughs> uh, we just talked about railroad and industry. Last week, we talked about Erie Canal. If you're interested in anything prior to 1850, go back and check out that episode. Um, because we have this whole playlist built out for you guys to be able to easily access what year you want to look at and hear the history of that. But you have to bear our talks beforehand which is fine which is absolutely fine michael i think it's time is it yes it is time all right take us out do, do the plugs all right had to take a deep breath we are on facebook as a buffalo happy hour we are on instagram as buffalo happy hour 12 we're still suing the person that has buffalo happy hour on instagram i know uh we are not on twitter because it's too negative and we are on YouTube. Please subscribe. We appreciate any and all support. Mm-hmm. If you want to buy a sweater, we have some still available in most sizes. So we appreciate all support. Donations for the sweater is going to the Buffalo Niagara Waterkeepers nonprofit organization, which cleans our water and shorelines. Yep. And they make uh, our sweaters make great Christmas gifts, too. Yes. I can't emphasize this enough how comfortable they are because honestly, my word doesn't mean anything to you people because I'm trying to sell these sweatshirts. Who the hell is you people? You people, our listeners, because we don't have names for them yet. We're not trying to sell. We're trying to move product because we are trying to donate to a local nonprofit. AKA sell product so we can donate. (laughs) Move isn't a better term. It means that we're giving it away for free and we're not. So we're trying to sell these, but... Ask anybody that bought one. Price Honestly, not kidding. Ask anybody that has bought one of these sweatshirts, and you are going to be astounded with their response because they are the best sweaters in all of the land. I can guarantee it. They're up there. Yeah. So, everybody, this has been episode 62. One. one? Mm-hmm. 61 of the Buffalo Happy Hour podcast. Thank you for watching, everybody. We really appreciate it. And uh, join us here next time. So just be a good person, drink responsibly, and we'll see you here next week. Don't litter. Peace. Oh,